because we've had Dr. Haynes with us once already and, and once more, and also we tend to have Dr. Haynes once every 12 or 14 minutes, 12 or 14 months, we spend a little bit less time on his, that was no, yeah, no reference to how long he's talking. Um, a little bit less time on his biography and what he does. Most of us know him as a Rose Professor. And I want to say a word or two about the overall series before introducing his topic today. And I just want to, rather than doing a formal word or two about our overall series, what I want to do instead is just acknowledge how interesting this series is and frankly how difficult it is. Um, I, I know that I'm not alone in feeling like, as I've listened to these speakers, just how, how obvious it is when we're looking at the subject of religion and violence, what an incredibly and literally, in some cases, painful subject this is. We have been absolutely best blessed by terrific speakers intellectually, and I've really enjoyed hearing the range intellectually that we've heard from. Um, Stephen did a very eloquent job a few weeks ago presenting foundation of pacifism and nonviolence. You can say a little bit more about that today and also the other side of the arguments. Deanna Neal, who was with us from the Air Force Academy, was just wonderful. Um, her video is posted online if you missed her. Gave a really eloquent and coherent and incredibly succinct justification for the just war doctrine within religion and Christianity. And then last week, um, Andrew Micta, who's a colleague of Stevens at Rhodes, did such a fantastic um, job talking about the international scene. And it, it was really you know, frightening to think about some of the religiously sanctioned and inspired violence in this world coming out of ISIS and other groups. You know, Andrew, of course, has his own solutions for what he thinks should happen. Um, others of us might have other solutions. I am certainly not capable of um, getting into, into solutions for what we face, but as a, as a pastor, I'll say this. I think it should break our heart. I think it does. Um, just the, what we're living in. And one of the things that I think that we should always remember, especially as we intellectually engage with this topic, as we must, as we should, but I do think we should remember that old phrase, what is it, that, that peace and justice always begins at home. And I've been thinking a lot about that, about how we're really struggling to think about how we live with our neighbor out in the world or in the country. You know, sometimes it's, it's a little bit hard to live with the people we live with, isn't it? And just to be in the community. So let's pray for peace amongst ourselves and within our own hearts as well. The last group of people that I really want to think about is, um, is, is two groups, really. I want to think about our military. And we pray for them. Um, one of the things that I always think about for our military is they have to implement what someone else decides. And so I think about the way in which not only they offer their lives, but ways in which they suffer for the sake of conscience and maybe have little power to do anything about it. So I pray for them in that regard. And then I also pray and think about there's a wonderful prayer for them in the prayer book for people who are um, pacifists and suffer for the sake of conscience and really try to live, live equally brave lives as well. And I'm also very aware that those two groups of people are in my own family and in my own church. And I pray that they may find a home and peace here with one another. And let the people say, Amen. Amen. With that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Haynes. Welcome again. I thought you were just going to keep going. I was ready to <coughs> seed. Can you hear me? I've got a mic on. So should I move something or? How's that? Yeah. It's good to be with you again. Um, this has been a kind of a long series with a break in the middle. Uh, I was here, I guess, two weeks ago to hear uh, Diana. I didn't get here last week to hear Andrew, but I've heard him enough times to have a sense of what he probably said. So this is, you've been all over the place, and um, I'm going to take you somewhere else today. And I'm curious at this point, um, for those of you who've been here more than once, uh, what have you learned? What are the insights that you've gained? 
from the pictures that they've draw, uh, drawn yeah. of um, what we're up against. So terrifying realities out there, yeah. The other thing that I was sort of taken with is how much structure there is around thinking about it. Mm -hmm. The idea that a just war isn't just that they hit me, I need to hit them back, right. but that there's a whole set of rules and structure that goes There's a the tradition way. that's developed over time, over the centuries, to assess whether a particular conflict is in fact justified. Yes, that's very interesting and something most people don't know, including most Christians. Right? Yeah. What else? I, I think that there's been argument about the, the reason for wars and, and uh, you know, the, some, some of them are, are because of, of belief, some of them are because of money, uh -huh. and, and uh, I, I didn't look at that before. Wars have different reasons, different explanations, right. um, different um, different sources. Okay, good. What else? Anything? Yeah. Uh, just one thing I noticed, both through when I've been here and historically, it seems to me that religions that at one time or another spread themselves by the sword, the longer that faith is around, around and the deeper the tradition, they tend to draw away from that. Okay. So, did everybody hear that? I'm not sure I can paraphrase it. Religions that, uh, that become sort of established through the sword end up moving away from that uh, in a later period. Okay, anything else? I'm gonna do something, yep. Yeah, I, I think that probably changed uh, about World War I. And one of the things that historically we're gonna talk about today, it's interesting, is that up until World War I, people saw war a little differently. It was a sort of affair of honor, and there were rules, that, and it was sort of limited in scope. Uh, World War I changed all that. So it's a nice segue to what I wanna to say today. So I'm gonna do something I've never actually done before. Um, I'm going to try to compare two figures, two important figures from the last century um, who moved in opposite directions on this question of, of violence and warfare. People you may have heard of, Reinhold Niebuhr and Dietrich Bonhoeffer. They both have German names. Uh, Niebuhr is an American, uh, Bonhoeffer is a German, but they actually, their lives intersected in New York in 1930. Uh, Bonhoeffer was a student of Niebuhr's and then um, they intersected a couple of other times later, but they sort of passed each other in terms of where they were headed on this question of violence. Niebuhr starts out as a pacifist, ends up being what's called a Christian realist, or, or an advocate of, uh, maybe not an advocate, but one who, who assumes that war is probably necessary as a, as a reflection of, of the conflict that's part of society. And Bonhoeffer starts off as kind of a just war guy, ends up becoming a pacifist. The question I wanna leave you with is, whichever direction you go, uh, one has to think about the implications of one's point of view. Are you willing, if you're a just war advocate, are you willing to accept war, whatever uh, features it might have? This was what, what Niebuhr encountered in, in, uh, during World War II. And as for Bonhoeffer, if you claim to be a pacifist, are you willing to live up to the implications of that, even if you find yourself in an, in, in, under the Nazis where you have sort of evil incarnate um, running amok? So that's my, uh, that's my hope. Here are pictures of the two guys. Um, if you've never heard of Reinhold Niebuhr or read any Niebuhr, it's really a treat. And I have to say, I, the last couple of weeks I've been reading Niebuhr again. What a brilliant man and a brilliant writer and a brilliant apologist for Christianity and the Christian sort of view of the world. And uh, so it's, it's worth uh, exploring. Bonhoeffer, I hope you've heard of. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Bonhoeffer, I have some books to suggest to you. Um, but we can talk about that afterwards. So Reinhold Niebuhr is this guy who is very unusual for us to think about because he was a sort of celebrity theologian, which is a category that we really don't, don't have so much anymore. Um, <laughs> this is the 25th uh, anniversary of Time Magazine cover, and he's on it. This is 1948. This is the same year that Niebuhr was being, his name was being kicked around as a possible candidate for president in the Democratic ticket. Um, he was a member of the Council of Foreign Relations. He was working for the State Department as an, as a, uh, an advisor. This is somebody with immense influence, not only among Christians, but among secular thinkers, historians at the time. And so it's important that we think about how his ideas both were shaped by American history and also uh, shaped them 
the other way. So to give you sort of a brief uh, synopsis of Niebuhr's career, he grows up, he was born in 1891, he grows up at the beginning on the turn of the century, uh, first two decades of the 20th century, um, and he is uh, imbued with what's called the social gospel, which was the dominant <coughs> sort of theology among mainline Christians at the time. The social gospel was essentially the belief that if we try to apply the, um, uh, the, the bases of the gospel in contemporary life, if we try to establish the kingdom of God in contemporary society, we can be successful and things like disease and war and conflict will end. Uh, we have the means to do it, we have the knowledge to do it, we have the motivation to do it, there's nothing really stopping us. So it was a, a profoundly optimistic view of the world. It tended to be pacifistic because if it's possible to do away with war, why would you want to uh, uh, in any way advocate war? So this is a definition uh, of, um, of the kingdom of God that Niebuhr later himself is caricaturing because he's, he's left it, but uh, the kingdom of God is an imminent force in history culminating in a universe, universal society of brotherhood and justice. It's hard for us as people living in the 21st century to take seriously that view. But it was very common among intellectuals and particularly liberal Christians in this time. Um, there was also the Great War, and I call it the Great War because, of course, uh, it wasn't called World War I at the time. And for us, I think World War I is sort of eclipsed by World War II uh, because it's more recent and uh, perhaps we have family members who are involved. World War I was a devastating experience for Europe and for America. Um, wars, as I said before, had, had you know, been somewhat predictable and um, limited. World War I was not at all. It was, a, it was a, a terrible experience for people. Millions of people died. Several hundred thousand people died in, in individual battles without the battle lines actually changing very much. It was a terrible waste of life. Um, people uh, were gassed. Here's the other thing about World War I. Just briefly, um, people died in very impersonal ways, really, for the first time. It wasn't me it wasn't hand to hand combat. Um, it wasn't being overrun by a group of, of of soldiers. It was being gassed. It was having um, bombs lobbed on you. It was having your tunnel or your your um, what do you call it? Trench, trench. Your trench blown up from underneath, uh, being bombed uh, from above. These were terribly impersonal ways to die, and it really left an impact on people who survived it, including Niebuhr who came to the conclusion that um, the idea of war as a method for advancing liberal society, advancing, advancing democracy, was really problematic because it left so much devastation and so much, um, so much resentment in its wake that it probably was not effective. The other thing that happened in Niebuhr is as a, as a German American, somebody who had been born in this country but was very attached to the old country, he had an experience in 1923 in which he traveled to the Ruhr region of Germany, which is part of the region in the Rhineland between Germany and France. And you may remember from history that in 1923, the French actually invaded the Ruhr because the Germans uh, uh, failed to meet their reparations um, responsibilities. And so you have people in the Ruhr region, Germans, who are being occupied, who are suffering from hyperinflation, um, who are sick, who are underemployed, um, who are miserable, and this has a profound effect on, on Niebuhr. Um, and he says at that time, um, in, a, in a diary, this is as good a time as any to make up my mind that I'm done with the war business. And this was not unusual for people in the outcome, in the, in the wake of, of World War I, to take that view. So keep that in mind, because he's gonna um, come quite a bit, um, he's gonna move quite a bit from that position. This is a picture of World War I that I show my students because it just so beautifully uh, captures everything I've just been saying. Um, mud, confusion, um, uh, people, uh, crowds traveling, people not knowing where they're going. Um, what what uh, Niebuhr says later uh, about what happened to him during the war is, is he describes this optimism that he had had rooted in the 19th century. I thought freedom was broadening down from precedent to precedent, and that virtue needed only time and the aid of electricity to win its victories. It's a beautiful Niburian yeah. kind of understatement. Um, identified civilization with the kingdom of God. This is clearly something he could no longer do in the wake of World War II, World War I. Then he has another experience that's very, um, that's very influential. He goes to Detroit to uh, 
after seminary to take his first pastorate. And it is a, um, a time when Henry Ford and the Ford Company are making <coughs> automobiles and they, there are no union, there's no union power to speak of and basically Ford is amassing a great fortune uh, on the backs of workers as, as Niebuhr sees it. And he realizes that um, capitalism, sort of unbridled, uh, is not the uh, unalloyed good that many people thought it was. Uh, he starts to see modern America through the eyes of, of workers, for instance, in a steel foundry, who have very little, you know, uh, sort of health protection of their health and so forth, who sort of live and die in this, in this place. And Niebuhr is taught by Henry Ford some lessons that he was never taught in seminary. And he, he will call it later uh, collective egoism, how um, groups, collectives, are uh, much less moral than individuals. Individuals may have the best intentions, but when they uh, get together in companies or in countries or in any kind of alliance, they sort of, th their power takes on this amoral character that can be very destructive. So Niebuhr starts to question his pacifism in the 1920s. He does so in a public way and he has to break away from a lot of the people who were his friends and people who were, uh, whom he was on boards of organizations with. And he, in 1927, writes this article called A Critique of Pacifism in which he makes the, the point, this is sort of the beginning of his breakaway, that if you're um, uh, sort of uh, economically stable and you're, you feel like you have a good place in the sort of, at the table of nations, pacifism is an attractive idea. If you're Germany and everything's going to hell in a handbasket, um, pacifism doesn't perhaps look so attractive. Then there was also the Manchurian crisis. I had to look this up. Um, I wasn't really sure exactly what he was referring to. Um, but basically what happened is that the Japanese invaded China in 1931 and the world sort of stood around and did nothing, including the United States. And what Niebuhr realized is that all the sort of, um, all the sort of posturing about, you know, the importance of, of morality and protecting human rights and so forth really didn't mean anything if national interest was seen to conflict with those, those views. And so he becomes very um, disheartened in the idea that, that nations are going to so, somehow do the right thing, uh, whether or not it's in their national interest. And then 1938 is the, is the sort of uh, the straw that breaks the camel's back. You know that um, from your history classes, I'm assuming that you all know this, but perhaps you don't, perhaps you had to look it up like me, um, that uh, the, the British were so afraid of a war with Hitler that they were willing to appease Hitler with, by virtually any, any means necessary, including giving away part of Czechoslovakia. <coughs> Um, and so this is sort of the, the final straw for Niebuhr. He realizes that pacifism is a great idea. Um, it's just the problem is that in the world as he knew it and as it was increasingly becoming, uh, coming to be, it was, it was kind of irrelevant. It was relevant as a goal, as sort of an eschatological um, uh, goal that Christians should have, but it's not probably useful in the, in the interim period. Um, so, he writes a couple of books that I just, I can't recommend enough to you. They're easy to read uh, and they're profound. And one of them is called Moral Man and Immoral Society, written in 1932. This was uh, the book I mentioned a minute ago. He talks about collective egoism. This is sort of where he describes this. And it's remarkable reading this. Some of the insights he has are insights that people think they're making for the first time today about, you know, systemic injustice and about the way um, uh, you know, privilege uh, uh, operates. He, he's talking about this in the 1930s. Um, and one of the conclusions he comes to is that conflict is inevitable. It's part of human life. And so uh, conflict, in this conflict, power must be challenged by power. And this is his realism coming into, into, into vision. Um, realism is an approach to the world which says that this world is, is sinful, it's fallen, conflict is inevitable. The only question is, um, how are we going to use power uh, against power to minimize conflict or perhaps to protect the innocent? So, um, I'm going to skip over well, a couple of these, but a couple I'll, I'll mention. Um, this I thought was interesting, and uh, he says, society is in a perpetual state of war. 
And if you make that assumption, then of course thinking about war becomes much easier because if it's always war, just then it's a question of what kind of war and how you manage it. Lacking moral and rational resources to organize its life without resort to coercion except the most immediate and, imme and intimate social groups, men remain the victims of the individuals, classes, and nations by whose force a momentary course unity is achieved and further conflicts are certainly created. Even peace, what looks like peace, is actually not. It's just uh, a particular set of, of power relations are dominant and create a kind of stability based on oppression. This is what he's saying. Um, and he's also very aware of nationalism and the way that it um, sort of affects people's view of things. And let me just say as a little aside here. I was thinking about this when Diana was here a few weeks ago. Um, and I would, I would phrase it this way. The problem with just war theory is that most of us have never seen a war we don't think is just as long as it's the, uh, perceived to be at the benefit of our country. That's the problem with it. If you could uh, make just war theory operate in a way that you could look at it objectively without the lenses of nationalism, patriotism, it might be more effective. The problem is, you know, we never, it's hard for us to see a war in a time of national crisis that's not somehow justified. Um, so, let's see, yeah, so here's another point that he makes uh, in this period in the 1930s. It is important to insist that equality is a higher social goal than peace. This is a really important um, sentiment because it suggests that pacifism, which has peace as its ultimate goal, may be misguided if really equality is a higher goal or, or a goal that's just as high. Perhaps power and coercion are necessary uh, because equality is important to protect. Okay, so then he writes another book uh, in 1939 called The Nature and Destiny of Man. Talk about titles that are ambitious. Um, <laughs> at least he gave it two volumes, right? He assigned one volume to the nature and one volume to the destiny of man. It's really a, a wonderful book. It's a series of lectures that he gave at University of Edinburgh in 1939. Right as the wo world was about to um, plunge into world war, they were attended uh, by many, many people. People sort of hung on his every word. And there's, I still use them in class uh, to give students a sense of what theology was like in the 20th century. Um, and so what he does in this book is develop fully this idea of political realism um, that we've talked about before. And he goes back to Augustine. Remember Augustine? Yeah. Sort of the first one to um, clarify just war theory. So it's not insignificant that this is where he goes. Augustine believed that the world was fallen, it was destined for conflict and, and suffering, and what Christians could do is look forward to the city of God, which was coming, and perhaps which was existing to some extent in their own community, but basically this was a dismal existence that we had, and um, so just war was often, uh, thinking was necessary because war was inevitable, and the only question was how do you make it you know, the least terrifying uh, and the least oppressive? Um, and then he says uh, during this time <coughs> that pure pacifism, which by the way he had just a few years early, earlier embraced, uh, was fine as an eschatological sign, that is as a symbol of maybe what the kingdom of God will bring. But it's a statement that could never be realized in history. Okay, last thing about Niebuhr. So the war begins and um, he is a, uh, the war begins in Europe in 1939. And he becomes the leader of a group called the Interventionists, uh, whose goal I think is pretty obvious from their name, right? Um, most American intellectuals at the time were isolationists, believed that this was a European war that we really had no business getting directly involved in. Niebuhr, in part because he's married to a Brit, in part because he's uh, of German heritage, but partly because of his theology, believes that Americans have a stake in what happens to Britain and what happens to France and we need to get involved. So you have somebody who 15 years before was calling himself a pacifist, who's now at the leader, among the leader of, of uh, intellectuals who are military hawks, um, who are advocating with everybody they could that the, uh, America ought to get involved in this war. By the end of the war, he's faced with the question of whether it's moral to drop an atomic weapon on your enemy. And you would expect, given the momentum of his thinking, that he would conclude that it, that it is. And, and that's exactly what he does. Uh, 
and he talks about it as, in dialectical terms, as the quintessential revelation of how much evil we must do in order to do good. So he's not saying that atomic weapons are sort of unmitigatedly good. Uh, they're terrible, but they're an indication of what we need to do in a fallen world sometimes to protect good. And then finally, the Cold War, he's very much uh, someone who believes in deterrence and so forth. So 20 years, 25 years, from the end of World War I uh, to the end of World War II, uh, Niebuhr has traveled just about as far as you can go, right, on the spectrum of pacifism, just war thinking. And I hope I've given you a sense of why he traveled that direction, what the, uh, incident, what the events were, what his experience were. So now I want to talk about um, Bonhoeffer and uh, a, a little different experience. This is a picture of Union Theological Seminary in New York in 1930. Why would I show you that picture? Among the people uh, who were there at this time were Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who was born in 1906, so he was uh, 24, and Reinhold Niebuhr, who was about 40. Niebuhr had just come to Union Seminary. He was kind of a, uh, a big catch for the seminary, and uh, Bonhoeffer was a, an exchange student who was gonna spend a year in New York. He took Niebuhr's classes, didn't like him, didn't like American theology, didn't like Niebuhr's sort of, um, the way he would tell stories in class and, and uh, talk about fiction and things like that, which were very unfamiliar uh, from an educational standpoint. Um, but they did know each other. And I wanna say a little bit about how Bonhoeffer got to uh, union uh, before we go further. I, I debated w with where to start with, Nie with Bonhoeffer. I could go back to the beginning. There's a lot of interesting things to tell, but I begin with his college days. Um, he went to the University of Tübingen in Germany, which is a fine university. It's the university his brothers and his father and his uncles had gone to, and he joined the fraternity that his brothers, fathers, and uncles joined, as many of us have done. Uh, they were called the Hedgehogs. And they did the things that uh, German fraternities at this time did. They engaged in sword play and, and the things of that nature. And they also went on a kind of military um, exercise for two weeks in the summer, so almost like pledge training. They went and they carried guns and they, they uh, you know, sort of learned all these things. It was just part of the culture that he grew up in uh, following World War, World War I, the idea of protecting the homeland from any, any kind of invasion, internal or, or external. Um, after he has his fun, he comes back home to Berlin in 1924 and gets serious about uh, education. He decides to study theology, and it turns out, it was already evident that he was a prodigy musically and that he was very brilliant. It turns out he's an incredible, uh, has an incredible theological mind. He finishes his PhD at the age of 21. For those of you who have been uh, in academics, I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> <laughs> He finished his PhD at the age of 21. So he was not yet qualified to teach in a German university. That requires a second dissertation called the Habilitationsschrift, which he wrote as well and finished that when he was about 23. But he was really too young to do any of the things he wanted to do. He was too young to be ordained as a pastor. He was too young to take a, a job as a, uh, as, a, as a professor. So he decided to travel and he goes to Barcelona. Um, and this is one of the things about Bonhoeffer that makes him I think very distinctive during his time among the people he lived with is Germans tended to be very insular after World War I. They tended to be very inward focused. They tended to really uh, have a lot of fear of what others thought about them and being misunderstood. Bonhoeffer didn't have that for whatever reason. He traveled constantly, spent a year in Barcelona. It's a, there are lots of funny stories about Barcelona, but I'll spare you. Um, the one thing I want to mention is that he was uh, given the opportunity to do a lecture series in Barcelona, and he talked about Christian ethics. So this is somebody who's, uh, what, uh, he's born in 1906, so he's 22. Um, so this is early, you know, immature thinking, but he, he um, recites what is essentially a standard German understanding of war at this time. He says in this lecture uh, on foundations of a Christian ethic, in the Christian argument against war, the decisive dilemma is overlooked, the dilemma which becomes clear the instant my folk is attacked. And by the way, you might notice the word folk is rarely translated into English. It means people, but it doesn't have the same connotation in, in English as the word in German. The word in English, this is a people, 
This is a group of people. In German, folk re re refers to a kind of spiritual and historical unity that people share. It's almost a racial term. Um, the dilemma that for me the love commandment extends at least as much to the protection of that which is mine as it does the prohibition against killing the enemy. Love for my folk will sanctify murder, will sanctify war. God calls the folk to manliness, to battle, and to victory. People have pointed out that this almost sounds like proto-Nazism. And it's, it's an embarrassment for Bonhoeffer uh, later in his life. It's an embarrassment now for Bonhoeffer scholars. But it gives you a sense of how imbued Bonhoeffer was with this sort of cultural uh, attitude toward war. That as long as it was engaged in protecting the folk, it was justified. Right? So keep that in mind, because he's going to um, come a long distance from that. So this is one of those pictures of Bonhoeffer that has become iconic. This is him on the ship sailing to New York in 1930 to begin his studies. Um, he arrives at Union Seminary, and of course, um, Reinhold Niebuhr is there among the other faculty members. This one doesn't seem very interested in the picture. I'm not sure why. Uh, and here is Bonhoeffer right here. So, um, but Bonhoeffer meets many people at Union, and one of the people's, people he meets becomes very critical for his uh, growth. It's a guy named Jean Lasserre, who is a French, so they're prepared to dislike each other. And he's also a pacifist. So they have virtually nothing in common. What they have in common is that they're both exchange students from, a, from abroad. If you've ever been a, an exchange student in a foreign country, like I have, you know that you suddenly have, realize you have very much in common with the Greek and the German and the Chinese and so forth that live on your hall because you're an outsider like they are. And this is sort of what happened. Can, can you speak up a little bit? I can try. Is that better? Jean Lasserre. So Bonhoeffer gets to know this guy. He's sort of intrigued because Lasserre, it turns out, is a pacifist. And Bonhoeffer says to him, tell me, I'm curious, on what basis do you, uh, do you embrace pacifism? He goes, well, because of the Sermon on the Mount. He goes, oh, that's interesting. And so Bonhoeffer begins to read the Sermon on the Mount and think about it in a new way. Um, as not as this sort of impossible ethic to, to meet that sort of reminds us of how sinful we are, but actually of a, of, a, of a law for life for Christian discipleship. And it becomes something that is, is almost permanent with Bonhoeffer, this idea that the meaning of the gospel is really much simpler than people make it. It is trying to follow Jesus' words. Um, they end up traveling together. Um, this picture gives you a sense of what travel was like in the United States in 1930. They decided to go to Mexico from New York in a car that they had to abandon along the way. Um, but they got to know each other very well. They also went to Cuba together over Christmas break. So these people became fast friends. And over time, this sort of pacifism, this Christ-based pacifism that Lasserre had really left a mark on Bonhoeffer. So he talks about it later, about this year in, in New York and what it meant to him. And it, it meant a lot. Um, this is the way he describes it. I plunged into my work my study in a very unchristian way. An ambition that ma many noticed in me made my life difficult. Then something happened, something that has changed and transformed my life to the present day. For the first time, I discovered the Bible. I had often preached, I had seen a great deal of the church, spoken and preached about it, but I had not yet become a Christian. Also, I had never prayed or prayed only very little. For all my loneliness, I was quite pleased with myself. Then the Bible, and in particular, the Sermon on the Mount freed me from that. I suddenly saw the Christian pacifism that I had recently passionately opposed as self-evident. This letter is really crucial for understanding you know, this change in Bonhoeffer and for understanding why American evangelicals in particular are drawn to Bonhoeffer. Because there is this, this sense that one can do theology and be a church figure and go through the motions and not have any spiritual depth to it. And Bonhoeffer realizes this about himself. Uh, and, and in this turning point in 1930, um, sort of embraces the spiritual disciplines of the Christian life. But he also embraces stuff that evangelicals tend not to be very comfortable with, pacifism. Not just as an option, but as self-evident. In other words, if you read the Gospels with an open mind, if you read them with, with open eyes, you will, be a, you will see that pacifism is, is self-evident. And he's gonna stick to this, but it's gonna be tough because he's gonna find himself involved in a conspiracy to kill Hitler. So how does a pacifist do that? Good question. By 1931, so this is three years after Barcelona, 
he's writing about war for his uh, ordinate, his uh, uh, confirmation students. He's writing his own confirmation um, uh, sort of um, uh, treatise for them, things to learn, because he doesn't like the ones that are available. So he says in there, the church knows nothing of any sacredness of war. The struggle for existence is carried on within human means. The church which prays our Father only asks God for peace. And then he says something very similar uh, in an article. Um, he basically, by 1931, by the time he returns from New York, he's completely abandoned the idea that war can be just, that it can be uh, Christianized, that it can, can be something that one's obligated to on behalf of one's people. So this is a complete and complete change. He gets involved in the ecumenical movement after returning from New York, which at the time tended to be very pacifistic. And the ecumenical movement began in 1920 with an organization called, let's see if I can remember this, uh, the Society for the Promotion of Peace Among the Churches. In other words, it was a society of Christians in the uh, European, what was the European war theater, Germans, French, British, um, trying to understand how it is that they uh, were arrayed against each other in World War I and realizing that they never wanted to do that again. How do we as Christians work for peace? And Bonhoeffer becomes very interested in this and it costs him um, later on because he's, it's assumed that he is a pacifist because of his ecumenical work. We know that in 1933 Hitler comes to power in, in Germany. So now Bonhoeffer is 26, no that's wrong, 27, uh, a young man but one very uh, prepared for this moment and he becomes an, uh, an opponent of Hitler almost from day one. Uh, and it's a dangerous business for him. As it turns out, he's very well connected with his family and he he's, he's kind of has a prominent profile, so he's, he's not as in danger as others would be, um, but it, it's, it shows a lot of courage. <clears throat> About the time that Hitler gains power, we have this movement in Germany called the German Christian Movement, which was named to indicate the, the belief that if one was a German and a Christian, one would also be a Nazi. And this was their flag, the, the Deutsche Christian. This, they would uh, march to church in their uniforms and so forth. This was a movement that was very powerful in Germany, which, which Bonhoeffer opposed uh, tooth and nail. It helped that he had a brother-in-law and a best friend who were Jewish. And so for Bonhoeffer, this was not just a theoretical matter, but a, but a personal matter. One had to oppose the Nazis because he understood what it meant uh, for Jews. These two Jews were actually Christians. They were people who were believers, but their racial background made them uh, potential uh, victims of the Nazis, right? So Bonhoeffer in 1933 <coughs> writes a document that is pretty remarkable. Uh, in April 1933, just a, a couple of weeks after this law is passed by the Nazis saying that anybody of non-Aryan descent can be removed from, from German life essentially. <coughs> And Bonhoeffer says uh, that there are three ways the church can react to this. It can um, ask the state if it's doing what it should do. It should remind it of its responsibilities. It can aid the victims of state action. And he says something that almost nobody was saying at the time. The church has an unconditional obligation to the victims of any order in society, even if they do not belong to the Christian community. Nobody was saying people, the church ought to defend Jews as Jews. Bonhoeffer was actually saying that. And finally, the third possibility is not just to bandage the victims under the wheel, but to jam a wheel in the spoke itself. And this is really powerful because Luther's sort of understanding of church-state relations was that the state had its role, the church had its role, and they don't interfere with one another. And Bonhoeffer is basically saying the church may need to take a giant stick and jam it in the wheels of the state. Nobody was saying this either. People walked out when this paper was read. So Bonhoeffer is a pacifist, but he's also somebody who realizes that pacifism does not mean being passive. It doesn't mean sitting around. It might mean uh, making, uh, it might mean resisting. And this is something that very few people were considering at the time in Germany. Not surprisingly, he also gets interested in Gandhi. He wants to travel to India and he gets an invitation from Gandhi himself to go to India. But as it turns out, he also gets an invitation to uh, lead an underground illegal seminary in Germany about the same time. And this was what he really felt called to do. And he ends up going to Finkenwalde to, uh, to teach seminarians how to be Christians and pastors under the Nazis. Um, he makes a famous speech in 1934 at a place called Fano in Denmark, um, which is probably represents the, um, the ultimate expression of his pacifism. So this is in 1934. It was already clear 
that uh, the Nazis were be beginning to remilitarize, that there were conflicts brewing. And this is what he says in his address to these uh, people from all over Europe. How does peace come about? <clears throat> through a system of political treaties, through the investment of international capital in different countries, through big banks, through money, or through universal peace rearmament in order to gain peace. Universal peaceful rearmament in order to guarantee peace through none of these. For the single reason that in all of them, peace is confused with safety. There is no way to peace along the road of safety, for peace must be dared. It is the great adventure. Great venture. It can never be safe. Peace is the opposite of security. First time I heard those words, I was a grad student. It was 1983, and it was at the height of the sort of, uh, of Reagan and Gorbachev sort of uh, posturing toward each other over nuclear weapons. And I heard those words, and they hit me like a ton of bricks. Peace is the opposite of security. Because at that time, America was thinking purely in terms of security, of its security. And, and this idea that peace could not be um, could not be achieved through the avenue of security was really, was really stunning to me. Uh, I think it was just as stunning probably in 1934 to people. Now whether this is a practical view or not, it, it suggests that Bonhoeffer was uncompromising in his willingness to take pacifism seriously. Somebody asked him at the conference, would you be willing to go to war uh, if, if drafted? And this was something in Germany that was, was a rhetorical question. Nobody would say no. Um, conscientious objection did not exist in Germany. He says, um, I pray that God will give me the strength not to take up arms. And this is what he did with his ordinance, those who were about to be drafted. He didn't tell them not to go, but he made sure they went with a bad conscience. That's what one of the students says. He made sure we went with a lot of doubts. The idea was, this is not just the thing to do as a German. This is not just your duty as a Christian. This is something that needs to be considered in great, in great depth because you are about to take up arms possibly against other Christians in other countries. And you need to think what that, about what that means. And then another turning point for Bonhoeffer comes and it's Kristallnacht in 1938. This is the pogrom in Germany where about 200 synagogues are burned, uh, people are killed. It's just basically a night of terror against the Jews. And um, he decides shortly after that that he needs to leave Germany because he is not willing to be He's now in his, he's certainly of age to be drafted. He's not willing to be drafted into the, a, a, a war. And he knows a war is coming. And so he writes a letter to his friend in England, uh, Bishop George Bell. And he says, I'm thinking of leaving Germany sometime. The main reason is the compulsory military service to which men of my age will be called up this year. It seems conscientiously impossible to join in a war under present circumstances. And I highlight those words because there's a lot of debate about what Bonhoeffer meant uh, when he wrote this. Uh, some would say that what he meant, this was not a thoroughgoing pacifism, but knowing what he knew about Hitler and the possibility of war and the kind of war it would be, he was not willing to be called up. I should cause a tremendous damage to my brethren if I were to make a stand on this point, which would be regarded by the regime as typical of the hostility of the church toward, this, toward the state. Perhaps the worst thing of all is the military oath which I would have to swear, that is, allegiance to Hitler. In spite of much reading and thinking concerning this matter, I have not yet made up my mind what I would do under different circumstances. So perhaps his pacifism is wavering a bit, and, and it now depends on what the, what, the, uh, what the challenge is. But actually, as things are, I should have to do violence to my Christian conviction if I were to take up arms here and now. So his option, his best option, is to leave the country, and he does. He goes back to New York. Uh, Bishop Bell talks to Reinhold Niebuhr, who talks to other people. They get him a job in New York, a really cush job, part-time teaching, part-time uh, speaking uh, in various places. And he sails to New York, and he's there for two weeks, and he's absolutely miserable, and he comes home. Uh, much, to the, uh, much to the regret of the people who had worked hard to get him this job. So, but he comes home because he realizes, uh, in a moment of clarity, that if he's going to be part of a of rebuilding <coughs> church and society after World War II, he has to be there in the moment of crisis. He's left behind these men who have been drafted and who are trying to figure out what to do, and he's, he's you know, in safety. So he goes back, and he does something that one wouldn't expect of a pacifist. He gets involved in the military uh, counterintelligence uh, conspiracy uh, against Hitler. Why did he do that? 
Uh, he had a brother-in-law who was closely involved. He had a brother who was closely involved. And he knew a lot about what the Nazis were doing. He knew a lot about the conspiracy. And he decides that if he's going to be pacifist or not, if he's going to be a responsible Christian in this situation, um, he needs to be willing to play a role, which, which meant everything from um, traveling on behalf of the resistance to perhaps carrying a bomb, which he never was asked to do. Um, among his co-conspirators were his brother Klaus and two brothers-in-law, Hans von Dignani and Rudiger Schleicher. They were all killed by Hitler at the end of the war. The Bonhoeffer family lost five men, actually, to the conspiracy. Um, so it was, a, it was a great sacrifice for this family. And Bonhoeffer um, has several jobs in the conspiracy, um, which are not violent per se, uh, but certainly stretch the meaning of pacifism. The first thing he does is he writes a report about the deportation of Jews from Berlin in October 1941. And he writes, he sends this report to New York and Geneva. It gets to the World Council of Churches, to the, it gets ultimately to the, to the president. And this is a, obviously a treasonous act. This is something that he could be hanged for. Um, but he, he risks his own security um, to, make, uh, to make evident across the world what's going on. He also becomes involved in a smuggling action called Operation 7, which was designed to smuggle uh, Jews out of Germany into Switzerland uh, in the guise of being Abwehr agents, being uh, uh, security agents, and then they would just never report. Um, and he was, in fact, subverting Nazi Jewish policy uh, by doing this. And this was, again, a treasonous act. So he worked for the Abwehr, which was the military intelligence uh, agency, which had a sort of long-running dispute with the Gestapo. Gestapo was, co was uh, convinced that Bonhoeffer had no real role in the, in the intelligence agency, that, that he, there was nothing really of value that he could give. And so they were constantly trying to um, call him up to military service. This was a conscription notice that came in 1943. So as late as 1943, they were still trying to get him uh, into military service. And what saved him was the fact that he had a, what he called, and others called, a vital role in the intelligence service. And by the way, probably the most dangerous thing that, that Bonhoeffer ever did in the uh, service of the intelligence is that he traveled to Sweden to meet Bishop George Bell, the Bishop, Bishop of Chichester, uh, with a uh, briefcase which held the names of all the conspirators against Hitler. Um, and of course, if he had been caught, there would have been curtains for him, but also all the people named. So these are the things Bonhoeffer was willing to do in, in, as, a, as a double agent, essentially. Um, again, still as a, technically a pacifist, right? Um, but somebody who's playing a very dangerous game, probably much more dangerous than a lot of people who had been called up. So finally, he's arrested in 1943. Uh, it, uh, this Operation 7 uh, was sort of um, uh, understood by the Gestapo to be a very fishy operation. Bonhoeffer's put in prison. He goes to a place called Tegel, where he stays for two years. Um, he makes friends in prison, including this guy who is willing to smuggle him out of prison. Uh, has, a, has a mechanics uniform for him and all that, but he decides to stay. He's afraid that it will uh, negatively affect his parents and family. And by the way, the, he and his, the other people who were arrested at the same time were in different prisons, but they communicated each other through this complex scheme of making dots uh, under letters in books, going from the back to the front every other page, making dots under letters to spell words. And so this is how they communicated. So Bonhoeffer's indictment was that he was uh, escaping um, observation uh, by uh, continuing to do church work in 1939. Uh, Operation 7 was a plot to save Jews, it was. His foreign journeys were unrelated to military intelligence. Well, they were, but they kind of were, were. They were not, but they were. They had no idea what they were really related to. And that uh, Bonhoeffer's work to get confessing church officials exempted from military service, which he did. All these things were true. But they didn't have enough evidence on Bonhoeffer, and so they, uh, there's nothing they could really do but sort of hold on. Uh, the last straw for Bonhoeffer came in the July 20th plot. If you've never seen the movie uh, Valkyrie uh, with Tom Cruise starring as, uh, as Klaus von Stauffenberg, I really recommend it. Very good movie. This is the, the group of conspirators that uh, wanted to blow up Hitler's lair and kill Hitler in July, July 20th, 1944. Uh, this is what actually happened. 
Um, the bomb was in this briefcase here, put, which was supposed to be placed here next to Hitler, but was later moved here. It blew up. These people were killed, uh, but Hitler wasn't. This is what the lair looked like. This is Hitler shaking hands with somebody with von Stauffenberg standing outside. It was unsuccessful. Um, but of course, Hitler wanted to know who was involved. And ultimately, by 1945, he would track down everybody who had been involved and have them executed. Bonhoeffer was included in that group because in a safe in a place called Zossen, a, a military headquarters north of Berlin, there was a diary there that had been, uh, was supposed to be preserved until after the war, uh, which had the names of him and other conspirators in, it, conspirators in it. So now Bonhoeffer could be linked not only to the things he had been accused of, but to July 20th, and he went to um, a different sort of prison where they tortured people and he, he and his other uh, co-conspirators, all of whom would be liquidated eventually, were tortured for information. This is where he went, which by the way, uh, if you go to Berlin ever, there's a topography of terror museum in the basement of this building uh, where Bonhoeffer was held. It's a very interesting museum, outdoor. Um, he was later sent to Buchenwald concentration camp, stayed there for several months. And finally, on April 9, 1945, just two weeks before the end of the war, he was hanged at Flossenburg concentration camp. So this is not a picture of Bonhoeffer. This is from a film about his life. Uh, he was hanged. Uh, his body was burned, and he was, uh, the ashes were placed in a, in a mass grave. This is a good time to ask, you know, if you are a pacifist, if you claim to be a pacifist, does that just mean avoiding violence, or does it mean working against violence, resisting violence in ways that can be uh, hazardous to your health? And then going back to think about Niebuhr, if you're a Christian realist, one who understands that war is necessary, how far are you willing to go? Uh, are you going to end up having to justify uh, atomic nuclear attacks um, based on your, uh, your, your theology? So I got through it all. Um, this may raise some questions for you. Um, and if so, I'm happy to, to hear those and try to respond. Well, actually, let's do it this way. So we've only got just a couple more minutes. And, and the good news is Stephen's coming back for the last class um, next Sunday. And, and the subject for the last class is going to be the world today. I've given, I think the topic I gave you several months ago, if you can remember it, is um, religion and violence from ISIS to Ferguson, Missouri. So thinking about the way race, religion, violence all get tied That's together. All. That's all. Um, <laughs> so next week will be very provocative. He'll be here for a few minutes if you've got a question for him. We've got church in just a few. Stephen, know this. We're very, very grateful. Thank you. Thanks.